Dirk, and thanks to Isot for this uh, invitation to discuss uh, reconditioning. And if we think about it, the, uh, in the 20th century, uh, most of the transplant research has been focusing on transplantation. But now it's working so well that the research now is focusing on donation, trying to increase the pool of organs, resuscitate organs, which is the aim of this, uh, of this session. So transplantation saves life, but the donation process, in fact, induces injury, cell death, inflammation, and a combination of both. And that's what recondi reconditioning is all about. We need to repair organs that have been injured by the donation and transplant process, to repair them, to bring them back to a normal operational level, or even to resuscitate them when they have been destroyed to a point that they cannot work anymore. Uh, importantly, resuscitation and repair are active uh, mechanisms that need oxygen, they need temperature, they need a normal mitochondrial machinery, and I come back later to that. So, uh, graft dysfunction is a major problem, and usually reperfusion injury is seen as a major cause of graft dysfunction. But in fact, graft dysfunction is mostly uh, determined by injuries that precede reperfusion injury. And the best proof of that is that living donors experience very little in terms of graft dysfunction, because there is no preceding injury before reperfusion. Another proof of that is that biliary strictures, that, as you know, is a major problem after liver transplant, it's now uh, documented that those strictures that appear after transplant are caused by injury before reperfusion. So this means that trying to just uh, uh, abrogate ischemia reperfusion injury may not necessarily be efficient, and in addition, it may be very complex because this is uh, a series of all the pathways involved in liver ischemia reperfusion injury. So you can realize that it's not easy to abrogate uh, this, this, this uh, mechanism. So to quote Erasmus, who is one of the uh, most famous European figures and who actually has been living in Belgium for a few years, prevention is better than cure. And we believe that reconditioning, decreasing injury and restoring uh, the function is better than just trying to uh, uh, correct the injury. And reconditioning can be done in the donor, in the procurement, in the preservation, and that's what I will try to summarize in the next 10 minutes or so. Reconditioning begins in the donor, and this remains the most important things, donor management, and we, will, we would really ha like to have many more intensivists and anesthetists taking part to the ESOT and being an uh, uh, integrated part of the, of the transplant society because donor management is increasingly uh, important. And then standard donor protocol should be permanently fueled and should be including biological interventions that have been proven in randomized controlled trial to be efficient, and just to list a few, steroids and dopamine. Now, reconditioning the donor, I just want to make two points. First, there has been this uh, quite important observation by Pluck and uh, Nebo that an increased interval between brain death and procurement, in fact, may lead to less delayed graft function after transplantation. So it sounds that some mechanism of uh, inflammation triggered by brain death can, in fact, be inhibited by sort of, sort of self-reconditioning and so it seems that waiting, not rushing, may be preferable to rushing to the OR. So give it time to repair. And a second point I want to make on brain death is this very important, very recent publication, just fresh from the press months ago, showing that hypothermia may become a new standard in donor management, as it was shown here, that hypothermia leads to a reduced delay graph function in recipients of kidney transplant from donors who had been hypothermic and whether this uh, hypothermia works by reducing brain death inflammation has yet to be shown. Needless to say, warm ischemia in donation after circulatory death is bad. If there is no oxygen, if it's warm, it's really very bad. And to try to uh, resolve that, there has been uh, an, an uh, inclusion now in, of new protocol trying to cool the organs in the DCD as soon as possible by using those automated system of perfusion and cooling them very fast. But now there is a, a new generation of, uh, of system and there is a clearly a trend to switching from hypothermic with no oxygen to perfusion at a high temperature and with oxygen. Clearly the aim being to resuscitating, to recondition, if you will, those organs in, in situ. 
And I think it's fair to say that this is now becoming increasingly used in uncontrolled DCD. It's almost becoming a standard in uncontrolled DCD, and that's being tested in different centers listed there for controlled DCD donation. Now, the ultimate of uh, resuscitation would be to include the heart in those perfusion systems. Well, this has been done, and so non heart beating donors, if you will, have been transformed in heart beating donors by regional perfusion. And with this strategy, seven uh, heart transplants have been successfully transplanted in the last six months in Papworth Hospital. Well, if you think about it, we are still uh, preserving and transporting our organ, just like fish, in the eyes, uh, and that's it. Now, this publication uh, reminds you uh, that each additional hour of cold ischemia time is deleterious for the results. So it's clearly time to think out of the high box, and this is a bit pretentious because, in fact, we should say to rethink about the high box because uh, visionary surgeons and engineers have thought about this uh, before our generation. Just to list a few, Kutzra, Belzer, Lindbergh, Carroll. So we need to move forward to be dynamic, and this uh, landmark trial has clearly shown that dynamic cold machine perfusion is superior to static cold storage. There was a reduced DGF uh, rate in the machine perfused kidneys, and since this publication, those data have been confirmed by registry data and also by meta-analysis. What's the mechanism of this reconditioning effect by machine perfusion is probably combined, it's purely, probably purely a mechanical things, vasodilation, opening of the kidneys, better flushing, the kidney looks immediately kin, uh, nice and pink after a perfusion, but also more molecular pathways, uh, among them the protection and the preservation of flow uh, uh, dependent endothelial uh, protective genes like KLF2 and other pathways. What's not sure yet is whether is need to be continuous or delayed, and whether uh, or how long should be the duration of machine perfusion. Cold perfusion, we should be careful because it can also induce some injury. It can induce, it can activate the cuprous cells, like in this model of, of, uh, of liver transplantation. So it's also true also for the kidney. It can also uh, cause a shear stress and uh, injure the endothelial cells. Uh, the benefits of machine perfusion can be increased. Is Oxygen is added, and this has been uh, shown experimentally. So uh, if it's cold, there is still some metabolism. In fact, even if it's cold, and some oxygen is thus welcome. Whether this will also translate into the clinics is now being studied in two randomized controlled trials under the COPE consumption, trying to see whether adding oxygen to machine perfusion is going to improve the outcome. Liver machine perfusion, cold perfusion, has been introduced by Guerrera in the clinics. Uh, and as a post cold storage uh, strategy, and you could see in this uh, analysis a reduction in the peak of transaminase, an improvement in the early allograft dysfunction rate, but this was uh, retrospective. Uh, he is using this technique to recondition high risk livers, uh, but we'll have to wait for an RCT to draw definitive conclusions. Now, it's good to add some oxygen, so in the post cold storage machine perfusion, if you add even more oxygen, that's the OPE technique, it seems to be even better. And in this trial, comparing DCD uh, treated by HOPE versus control, there was a, a, a dramatic reduction of the peak of transaminase and also much less uh, of VRE strictures. And here, again, we need trials, and there are trials ongoing now at the moment. Uh, importantly, cold machine perfusion in experimental model has been shown to improve biliary integrity, and this is very important since biliary structures is a major problem uh, after liver transplantation. But even with machine, with machine perfusion, cold remains cold, and human physiology does not tolerate hypothermia even with, even with oxygen. So why not trying to mimic nature? We know that uh, in the warm and with oxygen, we permanently repair our organs, and we can preserve them for a long period of time. And that's the idea of ex vivo warm perfusion. Here, the system developed by Peter Friend for the liver, maintaining a liver alive, producing bile outside the body. And he could do that for 20 hours, even more. And more importantly, by treating livers exposed to 60 minutes of warm ischemia, and that would otherwise fail, those livers could work. This has now been translated into a phase one clinical trial, showing the feasibility of the technique. And there is now uh, an ongoing trial 
testing the superiority of this technique versus the uh, simple cold storage. So this was a phase one trial, 20 levers, and uh, a really good results, no bleed restrictions so far. So ongoing trials uh, is awaited, and we know that this technique has been also used by some centers to uh, resuscitate livers that could otherwise not be transplanted. And here too, machine perfusion warm seems to uh, uh, positively influence biliary regeneration. Another advantage with the liver is that it seems that warm perfusion can reduce steatosis experimentally on, the, on your left, as well as having this potential clinically too. Now, the same holds true for the kidney. Kidney warm perfusion has been an experimental reality, and this was introduced by Kustra, who could preserve kidney warms up to 20 hours, and he could show, just like friend in the liver model, that uh, kidneys exposed to two hours of warm ischemia that would otherwise fail could be resuscitated by this technique. This has been uh, translated in the clinics, mostly as a post cold storage uh, strategy by the team of Nicholson and Hosgood, with, again, good results uh, using an historical control and here again, we'll have to wait for the trial, which probably will be planned in the future. Uh, of note, this technique has already been used to recondition and to assess uh, kidneys which would otherwise not be transplanted. So you see the potential of those techniques. Heart warm machine perfusion is a reality. It's safe, as shown by this trial. But the most astonishing uh, proof of its efficacy is that it has been used to actually uh, resuscitate from uh, resuscitated heart from previously known cardiac death donors to preserve them and to transfer them uh, successfully uh, in the recipient, as shown in this publication. Here, too, again, we are waiting for the trials. Now, I should have started with the lung because the lung. Uh, colleagues are the most advanced, and they have directly used warm machine perfusion of the lungs, and they have directly used this strategy to resuscitate lungs which would have been otherwise rejected. They could resuscitate them with improving the uh, oxygenation and transplant them successfully. And I invite you to listen tomorrow to the, one of the late breaking uh, session, abstract session, where the results of the INSPIRE trial will be presented, showing for the first time ever in solid organ transplantation that warm perfusion is better than simple cold storage. Another advantage of warm perfusion is that it's the only preservation strategy which will gonna allow you to evaluate the metabolism and the function of your organ and thus probably to predict, to predict, which, uh, 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 to predict better the function of the organ post-transplant versus uh, the cold, uh, uh, cold preservation. It will also allow ex vivo surgery. It seems science fiction. It's not. Uh, the team of Birmingham has already split a liver during warm perfusion. This is one of the abstracts at this meeting. Lung surgery will probably also be one of the possibilities. Now, the last things I want to point out is that we are seeing two things. We are seeing that machine perfusion is going to be used as a platform to directly target the organ with cells, genes, gas, drugs, biologicals. And not just to, to repair, but to enhance. We, we learned yesterday about enhancement. Uh, well, this is not a, a science fiction. It's reality. It's going to be possible to provide an organ with extra abilities so it can better resist infection, uh, rejection, inflammation, ischemia. Drugs, biologicals, that's already a daily practice. But in the future, we'll be able to remodel the vessel wall just an example, by pre-treating the organ ex vivo with low level of anti-HLA to try to induce accommodation, just one example. Gas, there are all sorts of gas out there that have an anti-apoptotic and also anti-inflammatory effect. And with machine perfusion, we have the possibility to, di to directly target uh, those gas into the organs. And that, this is a promising strategy as already been suggested by this publication of the group of Nicholson. Gene therapy has been used for years in transplantation, in donors and recipients, and it works. It's effective against rejection, inflammation, rejection, but the limitations are the limited time window, of course, the efficiency of the delivery, and the immune response against the virus, and also the risk of malignancies. All those limitations will be removed by ex situ gene therapy. The proof of principle was already published by Professor Kutstra, uh, uh, 13 years ago, and since then, not only PIC, but even LUNC uh, from the team of Toronto have been enhanced, have been transfected with IL-10. And I predict that in the future, not only a viral vector, but also non-viral vector will be used, and not only DNA, but also uh, silencing RNA will be used. A lot of uh, data on mesenchymal stem cells. 
uh, that improve repair, and in various transplant models, they have been shown to improve regeneration, to decrease inflammation with multiple mechanisms, uh, mostly humoral and, and cellular. And here again, the machine perfusion is the platform to test uh, those cells and to recondition the organs. And here again, the team of Toronto has taken the lead and they recently published that microvesicles coming from those cells and containing RNA are capable of integrating themselves in the genome of the perfused organs and to improve lung function. And this was again human uh, lungs, so human lungs that have been enhanced. Now, uh, for the last minute, all the organs are uh, more susceptible to ischemia, reperfusion injury, and to, uh, to a poorer outcome. And this is true for all organs. Can we do something about that? Can we rejuvenate organs? Science fiction. Maybe not. Well, if you want to rejuvenate yourself, you should actually try to find a partner who is younger, and you should connect your vascular system to this person. Well, you don't need to go that far. If you get some, you know, some plasma from this person, it's gonna, it's gonna work too. And in fact, some growth differentiation factors are gonna work. It seems very simple, almost simple to be true, but in fact, the, the first order of those studies had to change lab and to move to another university and repeat the experiments before his paper was accepted uh, in, in, uh, in, a, in a journal. Well, Professor Kutstra has done that. He has uh, exposed damaged organs to growth factor and he could show ex vivo a major improvement in their function. There is also a lot of uh, uh, data on the telomerase inhibition in the field of oncology, but a contrario, telomerase reactivation can reverse tissue degeneration, can bring uh, h stimulus back to a whole full state. And this too has been applied uh, in rats where telomerase activation has been shown to reduce reperfusion injury of aged rat livers. Is the ice age over? I don't think so. Uh, there is in uh, nature some species who can hibernate. If we can understand them, we may be applied this to, to humans too. And we heard yesterday cryopreservation, there are uh, Arctic frogs out there which survive freezing, and this has been applied in rats, and rat livers have been supercooled and uh, transplanted after three days at minus six. I think we are not either cold or warm, we are not, see, uh, we are not seeing fully all the possibilities that long-term preservation will allow, uh, assessment, long-distance shipping, pre-treatment of the, of, the, of the recipient, daytime surgery, and so on. I'd like to conclude and telling you that, uh, uh, hoping to convince you that reconditioning is going to be is equally important than post-conditioning. It's not just repair, it's also organ enhancement, allowing the use of higher risk donors and improving the results. And during the, the free phase of the transplant process, donation, procurement and preservation, humans do not tolerate uh, cold for long, but they throw it better with oxygen, but some species out there do tolerate cold, we may learn from them. True repairs needs ATP uh, and a normal mitochondria, and so oxygen and temperature. At that time, basically all organs have been successfully transplanted after warm perfusion, and warm perfusion can allow the assessment of the function of the metabolism. MP is a platform to test all sort of technique of gas, cell, and gene therapy to uh, organ, uh, for uh, organ enhancement. Long-term preservation is likely to open unsuspected avenues. There are a lot of trials out there. We are waiting uh, anxiously for the results, and probably uh, strategies of those, uh, uh, combination of those strategies will have to be used and adapted to the graft and the patient need and logistics. We should not oppose reconditioning and engineering, because both techniques, both strategies, I think, will merge as they are using a similar uh, technology. So the take-home message is basically that organ and donor reconditioning is not an evolution. I think it's a true revolution in transplantation medicine, becoming a specialty of its own, requiring dedicated and specialized intensivists, anesthetists, transplant surgeons, and organ professionalists, and the necessary investment and infrastructures. Thank you very much for your attention.